morning. Welcome to Connect. Uh, we're so glad that you have joined us this morning. Um, the build up to Easter is always such a big deal. There's a lot that goes on. We get our best clothes on. We take a family picture and all of that, uh, which is great. It's always a great Sunday morning. Um, but the nice thing, uh, the Sunday after Easter, is that all those things that we sang about, all the things that we talked about, all of those things um, are still true this week. Uh, they're just as true this week as they are last week. Um, this morning, we're going to sing about an unstoppable God who is good, who never lets us down, who, when we seek him, hears and he answers us. So I invite you to sing this, um, sit, stand and sing with us um, as we worship this morning. in the 
Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I ride, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my source. And let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my source. And you are You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh, we taste and see.
we're going to do uh, one that we haven't done before. Um, the name is called Trust in God. You may notice that it's based on a song that we've done before called Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance is an old hymn actually written uh, about 150 years ago back in 1873. Um, some of the lyrics for Blessed Assurance show up in this song as well. I think they use that as kind of a starting point to take those same truths that are in Blessed Assurance and then create a new song to say the same things in a different way. So like Blessed Assurance starts out, uh, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. It also says, perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, I'm happy and blessed. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. So we're going to sing, uh, I, I, what I like about this song is it's the same words, the, the same, uh, some of those same words, the same feelings, the same beliefs about that, just written in, um, in, in a, a modern um, song that we're going to sing this morning. So uh, this is called Trust in God. Um, we'll go ahead and, and sing that now. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He fed my fourth man in the fire time after time. Born of his spirit and washed in his blood. trust in God, my Savior, one who will never fail. He will never fail. So I trust in submission and all is at rest and I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my days so this is my story and this is my Trust. 
morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here this morning. Uh, when we first announced that we were going to include high school and college students in our Easter egg hunt this year, some of y'all looked at me like I had an antenna growing out of my head. Uh, but I think the video shows that they had a pretty good time last weekend. Uh, so thank you to everybody who helped out uh, with all of our Holy Week activities. Uh, it was a really good, a good weekend together. Um, <clears throat> so this is the moment in the, the, the service where I welcome new people. Uh, and you can see that this is the Sunday after Easter this morning, right? <laughs> A little more elbow room here this morning. Uh, but even if you're not new, uh, we would like you to uh, use the Connect cards. Um, they look like this. They sit on the communion table in the back, or you can scan the QR code here um, on the screen as well. Anytime that you're looking for information about events even or other things, if you have prayer requests um, or just information that you'd like to know, this is the best way to get in contact with us so that we can make sure you get all of the things uh, that you need. Uh, we've got a couple of announcements to get through this morning before we get to our message. Uh, the first is about Vision Night. Um, we're having these small gatherings over the next few weeks where we uh, are spending some time talking about uh, where we've been as a church, um, where we are now, and where we would like to go in the future. Um, if you're someone who calls Connect your church home, uh, this is an important event for you to attend. And um, we actually had the first of uh, the four and on Thursday evening. And it was a great time. I'm looking forward to the next three. Uh, thank you to the McDowells and the Goshels and the Wellmans for being our guinea pigs, helping us get it dialed in a little bit. Uh, now, if you haven't signed up yet, you can still do that, uh, but time is running out. Uh, the one on the 14th uh, next Sunday is already full, uh, and the other two are filling up fast. So uh, please get signed up if you haven't already at connect.cc slash events. Uh, the second announcement this morning is for our next Parents' Night Out. Uh, if you are a parent of a preschool or elementary-aged child uh, or children, uh, we would like to give you a break. Uh, this time of year, there are so many practices and rehearsals and projects, and sometimes it's just a bit overwhelming. You need, just need a, a little bit of time to yourselves. Uh, so on Friday the 26th, we'd like to give you just that. Uh, at 6 o'clock, that evening, you can drop your kids off at the Hesses, uh, which is just a couple of minutes down the road. Um, the kids will have a great time playing games and uh, eating snacks and doing other activities in a safe and supervised environment. And you can go out to dinner with your spouse or run some errands or just sit in the peace and quiet and not be talked to or touched constantly for a little while. <laughs> uh, last spring when we did this, uh, Lauren and I went and ate tacos and then we made a run to Home Depot uh, to get supplies for some yard projects that we were doing that weekend. We're not going to judge you for how you spend your time. But then at 9 o'clock, you can come back, pick your kiddos up, take them home. Uh, but if that sounds like an oasis in the desert to you, uh, then head over to connect.cc slash events and sign up for the Parents' Night Out today. Now, uh, so let's shift uh, gears a little bit. We're going to talk about our new series that we're beginning this morning. Um, every culture all across the ages has developed these little nuggets of wisdom, little pithy sayings that communicate some small idea or teach uh, a useful concept, and our culture is no different. I'm sure that we all have uh, several of these things stored up in the back of our minds. So let's, let's see if you can finish some of these sayings for me. Here's the first one. Uh, the early bird gets the worm. Gets the worm. That's right. Okay. Uh, how about this one? Better late than... Never, uh-huh. Uh, what about this one? Uh, actions speak louder than words. That's right. Uh, you guys are good at this. Uh, we'll do one more. April showers bring May flowers. They sure do. And, and, and we have had a pretty textbook April showers week this week, haven't we? Goodness. I mean, I think I've seen rain falling in every direction except for up this week. Uh, but th that's what you get here in southwest Ohio in the spring, right? Warm days right up against cold days and torrential downpours in between. Uh, 
But the truth of that proverb, April showers brings May flowers, is that even though the weather can be a bit wild and the skies can be a bit dreary, the result of those showers is the return of life, right? The death and desolation of winter uh, has given away to the hope of spring. Uh, Leaves on the trees, green grass, the flowers blooming all summer long. There is a promise inherent to the rains of April that as the spring progresses, there will be beauty that results. However, this saying doesn't just uh, refer to weather patterns or the change in seasons. Clouds and gray skies and rain are imagery that's used metaphorically when we talk about the pain, misfortune, and trials of life. When, when someone has a run of bad luck, we say it's like a black cloud is following them around wherever they go. Darkness and gloom is associated with pain and suffering, and sunshine and blue skies then are associated with prosperity and renewal and redemption. We're just coming off of celebrating Easter last weekend, so we're pretty well acquainted with this idea, right? The celebration of Easter is filled with images of the sunrise and brightly colored decorations and the renewal of spring. In Jesus, we have victory over sin and death. We're we're Easter people. Uh, However, the beauty of the resurrection sometimes gets used in ways that confuse or complicate our experience as followers of Christ living in the world. Uh, Real life is full of many ups and downs, but but sometimes in, in the triumph that we find in Scripture, it gets used in ways that suggest that if we follow Jesus, we should be immune to that pain and suffering. We won't have anything but clear skies and tailwinds all the way. We yank Bible verses like Jeremiah 29, 11 and Romans 8, 28 out of their context and we use them to demonstrate how and why we will be spared from all but most, uh, the most minor of inconveniences in our lives. However, if we pay attention to the stories in Scripture, what we find is that pain and suffering and grief are are common occurrences among people of faith. So this month we're starting in a series called April Showers, where rather than shy away from these realities, we're going to spend some time examining a handful of those stories to find out what real faithfulness and endurance look like and, and what it means to cling to faith even in the midst of our own struggles. So so let's pray together, and and then we'll take a look at our text for today. Heavenly Father, your holy name is honored throughout the universe as creation testifies to your glory. And this morning, we join our voices together in that song. Lord, we ask that you would allow us to be a part of bringing your new kingdom to fruition here in our community as we endeavor to love our neighbors as you have loved us. Give us all that we need in order to serve you well and forgive us for all of the ways that we fall short of what you've called us to as we forgive those around us who are struggling as well. Speak to our hearts today through your spirit and keep our eyes focused on you. We pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. So last week during the Easter message, I talked a little bit about the end of John 16, 33, where Jesus is talking to his disciples about the challenges that they're going to come up against as they are following him and serving him on into the future. Uh, to refresh our memories a little bit, this is what he, what he says there. Uh, it says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Um, I've always thought that this short comment from Jesus in John's gospel is a really important moment. Uh, You might have noticed, if you've been around here very long, that I bring it up a lot. Um, In fact, if you were to go through uh, every message that I've preached in the last 12 months, I'm pretty sure that John 16, 33 probably appears more often than any other single verse. And and that's no accident. Um, uh, I've, I've been in church my whole life. Uh, my parents, I was talking to my mom about this this week a little bit. My parents started attending church together shortly after I was born. And, and I've, I've been in church like almost every Sunday for the, almost the last four decades, which is wild to think about. And, and one thing that you notice when you've been around church for a long time is, is that we're really good in the aftermath of hardship. In the wake of tragedy, the church, not just Connect, but generally speaking, is, 
is really good at, at swooping in and, and offering comfort and hope. Well, I mean, we're, we're in the hope business, right? We, we have all kinds of resources and programs available to assist people in the process of recovering from trauma and loving them well in the process. However, the thing that the church has often struggled with is what to do with people in the midst of struggle. What do we do when, when people, with people who are currently hurting and for whom there is no easy solution or instantaneous fix? Uh, of course, we offer to pray about the problem and we encourage that person to do so as well. We, we offer some, some hollow encouragement with phrases like, when God closes a door, he opens a window, or uh, God never gives you more than you can handle, or if, if he brings you to it, he'll bring you through it. Or, or everything happens for a reason. Uh, so, some of you uh, in this room this morning are too young to remember this. But uh, when I was a kid, if you wanted a book or a movie or a magazine or new music, you used to have to go to the store to get it. I don't know, crazy, right? Uh, and back when there were these, uh, back in that time, there were these things called Christian bookstores. You guys remember this? Where they sold books and movies and music and trinkets and t-shirts specifically for church people. Uh, if you were to go over to the Eastgate Meyer right now and stand in the section with the greeting cards and the house plants and the books and magazines, you can kind of get an idea for what it was like inside of one of those stores, right? Like, you get rid of the house plants and just replace them with t-shirts and knickknacks that have Bible verses painted on them, and you've got a pretty good approximation of a mid-90s Christian bookstore. Uh, and in those stores, you would, you would find all kinds of paraphernalia from keychains and bumper stickers to blankets and wall hangings with Bible verses uh, like this one. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future, Jeremiah 29, 11. Uh, another one you might see would be uh, this one from Isaiah. Uh, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Uh, if you were an athlete, uh, you probably had a bracelet or a t-shirt with this verse on it from the Apostle Paul, right? I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now, as much as it's going to make my eye twitch, uh, for the moment, we're not going to talk about the fact that every one of these verses has been absolutely ripped out of their context, and therefore any real comprehension of what they were intended to communicate has been completely obliterated. But we're, we're not going to talk about that right now. Uh, the thing that we're going to talk about this morning is the themes that we see in these verses. You see, for as long as I can remember, the focus in the church when it comes to, to suffering has always been what comes next. The, the thing that each of these verses has in common is that it directs your attention to the future. They're about what will happen, what you have to look forward to, what your potential is. And that kind of thinking can be very comforting and very helpful when you've just been through a difficult season or trial in your life. When you're on the other side of tragedy, it can be helpful to be able to look around and feel like the Lord is with you and as you move into your new normal. Unfortunately, how good the future can be is not all that helpful of an idea for someone who is currently hurting. When you're in the midst of the storm, when the, the wind is howling and the rain is pounding, your focus is not on which contractor you're going to use to repair the damage. It, it's, it's not on what your house will look like when all the work is done. No, in that moment, your focus is survival. You're, you're, you're taking head counts over and over again. You're putting buckets underneath the leaks in the roof. You're hunkered down in the closet or the basement, and you're fully feeling the pain and the fear and the anger. And that's the place where, as followers of Christ, we often feel like we're out over our skis. It feels uncomfortable to feel those feelings. In, in the moment when we're hurting and, and afraid and angry, when we feel like we've been abandoned by God, like he's nowhere to be found, like he's left us here to die, like he, he could solve our problems if he wanted to, but he's choosing not to, for some reason we feel guilty. 
We're not supposed to have those thoughts, right? I mean, we're not supposed to feel those feelings. It's, it's, it's unfaithful. Scripture teaches us that we're just supposed to, to kind of pretend it doesn't happen, push it all down. We, we're supposed to have full confidence in our Redeemer and, and look ahead toward the future. We're supposed to face our challenges like David when he faced Goliath or Joshua when he stared down the walls of Jericho. And, and in this series, what we're going to see is that that just isn't true. And the place where we're going to look first is the short little book in the Old Testament called Lamentations. Uh, a lament is a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. And, and the book of Lamentations is a collection of poems that reflect on the destruction of Jerusalem and the exile of God's people from the promised land that we see toward the end of the book of 2 Kings. Jerusalem has been conquered by Babylon and laid to waste. Everything, including Solomon's temple, has been destroyed, and many Israelites have been driven from their homes. And the book of Lamentations is a collection of poems written by an anonymous author as they are observing the destruction. It's a very intentional book that was often used by God's people at different times throughout the year in their worship. The first four poems are what's called an acrostic or an alphabet poem. Uh, for example, the first uh, chapter is 22 verses, which is the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And each line or verse of the poem starts with a different letter in order. And there are five chapters, and each of them takes a little bit of a different view or tact uh, on the situation. Uh, the first chapter is written about the grief and shame of Lady Zion. It personifies the city of Jerusalem as this character and uses this device to express the pain and shame that God's people are feeling in this moment. Uh, here's a little bit of a sample of that. This is Lamentations 1.1. How deserted lies the city once so full of people. How like a widow is she who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. It's pretty bleak, right? You can, you can really feel the, the pain and the hurt that these people are feeling. Now, what you will see throughout the entire book of Lamentations is this back and forth between the expression of pain and grief that has been caused by the actions of the people themselves. They're experiencing this defeat, these hardships, the, the decimation that has resulted, but it's resulted as a result of their neglect of the covenant that they had made with God themselves. They're just experiencing the wrath of God as a result of their own unfaithfulness. But, but the cause of the pain is not really our concern this morning. The thing I want us to notice today is the duration. The suffering that we see here isn't just a blip. Uh, the suffering that we see here doesn't just pop up and then get quickly resolved. The pain and the grief linger. Let's take a look at the end uh, of this first poem. This is Lamentations 1, verse 22. Let all their wickedness come before you. Deal with them as you have dealt with me because of all my sins. My groans are many and my heart is faint. Do you see what's missing there? There's no resolution. This poem ends with the line, my groans are many and my heart is faint. Earlier we said we're in the hope business. Uh, our, our number one core value here at Connect is it's all about Jesus. Where is the hope here? Well, it, it must be in the next chapter, right? Uh, let's look. Uh, Lamentations chapter 2, verse 1. How the Lord has covered daughter Zion with the cloud of his anger. He has hurled down the splendor of Israel from heaven to earth. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. Yikes. 
uh, that, that sounds worse than the last one. But surely the resolution comes later in this, this chapter, right? Uh, let's skip to the end. This is Lamentations chapter 2, verse 22. As you summoned to a feast day, so you summoned against me terrors on every side. In the day of the Lord's anger, no one escaped or survived. Those I cared for and reared, my enemy has destroyed. So I think you can start to see where we're headed here. Uh, we're at the end of chapter 2, and everyone I cared for has been destroyed. There still isn't any hope to be found here. So let's move on then to the very end of the book of Lamentations. This is chapter 5, verse 19. You, Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures from generation to generation. Why do you always forget us? Why do you forsake us so long? Restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. And that is the way the entire book of Lamentations ends. It's kind of uncomfortable, isn't it? I mean, they acknowledge who God is. They ask for his mercy, but they do not expect it. From the perspective of the author, this could be the end of God's people. From their perspective, it is fully within the realm of possibility that they have been utterly and permanently rejected by God. That's pretty heavy, right? Did you know that there was an entire book of the Bible that fully develops from start to finish without a revelation that God will deliver and restore? There's no resolution. There's no happy ending. It's just loose ends. And this isn't the only place in Scripture where it happens. There, there are several psalms of lament in the book of Psalms as well that paint a similar picture. Uh, but I thought we were in the hope business. We just looked all over the book of Lamentations, and hope is nowhere to be found. What is this book doing in here? Why do we have this book here in the middle of the Bible that is just filled with pain and sorrow and mourning? Well, the book of Lamentations and the Psalms of Lament serve a few different purposes for God's people. One thing that they do for us is they give us an example of protest. They're, they're literally a case study of God's people going to God and drawing attention to their own suffering. God, we're hurting. We can't bear the weight of our own shame. God, do you even see us? These poems that we find in the book of Lamentations give us permission and room to go to God, not just with our hopes and fears, not just with our wants and our desires, but also with our anger and our pain, even if it's directed at God himself. Another thing that the book of Lamentations does is it provides examples of how to process the complicated emotions of life. It seems obvious that we can bring our joy and thanksgiving to God in prayer, that we can gather together in worship with our voices lifted in praise as we celebrate what God has done for us. That feels natural and normal to us because we know that God is good. However, as good, hardworking Midwesterners, we know that those more troublesome, harder to articulate, darker emotions, those we're, we're supposed to suppress right? Uh, we're just supposed to bury him deep, deep down and just wait for him to go away. At least that's what we've learned culturally. But that's not what the Bible demonstrates to us. Here we have a framework for a way of very publicly working through some very challenging emotions. And, and the third thing that Lamentations does is it gives us an example of someone voicing confusion. The reality of our interaction as finite human beings with an infinite, perfect, all-knowing, all-loving God is that there are going to be times in our lives where we do not understand. 
We don't understand what God is doing. We don't understand why he isn't stepping into a certain situation. We don't understand why God is taking so long to respond to our prayers. The list is way too long to go through, right? Every one of those possibilities. But here in Lamentations, we see this moment where God's people are looking back at God with their hands up going, we don't understand what's going on here. Where are you? We don't get it. So what can we learn from the book of Lamentations? How can our lives together be changed for the better in light of the contents of this book that's filled with pain and sorrow? Well, I think what Lamentations shows us is that God is not afraid of your pain and your anger and your criticism. He's not surprised by your confusion. He's not put off by your grief and your guilt. And having those feelings and even expressing them does not put you on the outside looking in. Last week, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about how Jesus intentionally set his face to the cross and orchestrated events in such a way as to force the hand of those who opposed him. We saw him get arrested and then not defend himself in front of his accusers. We saw him uh, not call down angels to save him from the pain and suffering of the cross. And yet, even though Jesus went to the cross willingly, even though he knew that this is what it would take in order to defeat sin and death once and for all, he still felt the pain and the loss of that moment. In Matthew chapter 27, we see Jesus on the cross, nearing his death, crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Your faith is not opposed to your pain or your grief or your suffering. Feeling angry toward God for the circumstances you're in, feeling confused about what God is doing in your life and the lives of those around you, feeling abandoned and afraid that God has turned his back on you doesn't disqualify you. It doesn't remove you from the body of Christ. It doesn't place you beyond the reach of the grace and mercy of Jesus. It makes you a human, and there's room for that. And it wouldn't be in here in the pages of Scripture if that weren't the case. But here's another question then. What if we aren't the ones that are struggling? This gets us back to what we were talking about earlier, right? As church people, we're really good at at coming alongside people who have suffered hardship and helping them recover. The place where we struggle is in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the anger, in the midst of the confusion. What's our response supposed to be then? How are we supposed to love people well when they aren't looking for hope? In his letter to the Christians in Rome, the Apostle Paul is talking about what love truly looks like. What it looks like to be living in the world as a representative of the love of Jesus. And in chapter 12 and verse 15, Paul says this, Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Too often when we are faced with someone we love who is hurting, who's struggling, our instinct is to try to fix the problem. We we don't want our loved one to hurt. We want good things for them. And so we try to make suggestions. We try to help. We try to offer wise counsel. But often what we're really doing is pouring fuel on the flame. Often all we have done is, is outkick our coverage. That's where all of those infuriating sayings come from. They come from a good heart. They come from kindness. But they just aren't what is needed. What's needed is our presence. Here at Connect, we say all the time, we are better together. And and this is just another example of how this plays out in our lives. We need one another. But not always because we need help fixing the problem. Sometimes... All we need is just not to feel alone, not to feel like we're the only one who has ever felt the way that we feel. We want to know that our pain matters to someone, and that's what our presence does. 
When we come and sit with our friend in their pain, we communicate love and we communicate endurance. I am here for you. I see how you are hurting and I am not going anywhere. If you are here this morning and you are hurting, if you're frustrated at your circumstances, you're confused and angry at why God has not stepped in and intervened, please hear me say this. There is room for your pain here. There is room for your anger here. There is room for your sorrow here. We are not going anywhere, and Jesus never has. It may not feel like it right now, and I I can't tell you how long it will last. But there is hope in the form of the man on the cross who wouldn't stay in the grave. And when you are ready, what you will find is that he is there, ready to welcome you with open arms. Lord, we come to you this morning, either in the midst of suffering, coming out of a season of suffering, or on the precipice of some pain that we don't see coming. And we ask today that you would help us. Help us to endure the hardships of life. Help us to come alongside one another as we struggle together. Help us to overcome our hardships and help us to be willing to bring those things to you in the process. Lord, we thank you for being willing to hear us out when we're angry, when we're hurting, when we don't understand. And we ask that you would reach through the anger and the fear and the frustration and help us to see the hope that we have in Jesus. We pray all of these things in his holy name. Amen. So now we're going to move into our time of communion. In Hebrews chapter 4, the author of the book of Hebrews points out something important and unique about our faith. In Hebrews 4, 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus, the Son of God, left his perfect fellowship with the Father and the Spirit, and put on flesh. He became a man, and he lived a life like you and me. He felt the exhilaration of joy and the pain of loss. He experienced pain and love and boredom and frustration and excitement and anger, and he's able to empathize with our experiences. When Jesus died on the cross, when his blood was poured out and his body was broken, he was not separated from us. He was bound to us and our experience as human beings living in this world. So as the band plays this next song, as we take communion together, let's be reminded that our pain and the challenges that we face in this world are not foreign to our Savior. He knows what we're going through, and he has been through it himself. Let's commune together and with our Heavenly Father.
great to worship with you all this morning. Have a great week in the Lord. We'll see you next time.